Welcome back to Business Analytics. Our focus today is on data governance. The objectives are, we will be looking at data governance principles. We will examine data as an asset. We'll define data governance. We'll assess data quality dimensions. We'll describe data cleaning principles and discuss security threats to an organization's data. Data is a corporate asset and should be treated as a corporate asset. Data is getting bigger, faster, and in more shapes and formats from more sources and is more complex to control. Data is more important for business both for operational and analytic purpose. Data should be accepted as an enterprise asset. And because it is an enterprise asset, data quality should be a part of everybody's job description. Data quality should be a parameter of performance evaluations and incentive packages. Human resource departments play a key role in this initiative. As employees are onboarded and their new hires, companies should build within their contracts responsibilities related to data based on their job functions. Employees should be assigned their responsibility for data. Everybody has a responsibility for data. The responsibility differs based on your job performance. Some person's responsibilities are to maintain the systems that keeps our data safe. Other person's responsibilities who analyze data, their responsibility is to ensure it is done in an ethical and safe way. And there are those persons who are responsible for creating data and they should ensure that they are responsible in maintaining good data quality. Data should be modeled like other assets within an organization. The question here is, how will companies know what value to be placed on their data? This will be uncovered based on what the data can be used for and what are the monetary values tied to this? That's one way to look at the value of data. Another way to look at the value of data is to look at what it costs you to save, store your data, as well as to maintain good data quality. Once an organization is serious about capitalizing on data as an asset, it is absolutely crucial that data governance becomes a key cornerstone of its strategy. Data governance is the execution and enforcement of authority over the definition, production, and usage of data and data-related resources. The aim is to establish consistent data quality, improve data integrity, control data access, and address data security and retention. For data governance to be a success, it has to be a collaboration between IT and the business. IT and the business must work hand in hand in defining policies around data management and handling, as well as data processing. Now an organization must have a data governance structure. Here we have a typical data governance organization chart. At the top of the chart, we have our steering committee. The steering committee sets the strategy and direction 
for the overall data product. It approves funding and resource allocation from the business units and it prioritizes the adoption of enterprise data capabilities. The steering committee usually consists of senior management and executives and this is where we decide what the overarching strategy is going to be for the company as it relates to data. Below the steering committee is the Data Governance Council. The Data Governance Council is made up of business data owners. They are the ultimate business authority for the data they own. They are accountable for data definition, usage guidelines, policies, and cost. They support data governance and standard st steam. Standard, standard develop investment recommendation for executive management review and approval. Now, to be clear on what a business data owner is, the business data owner is the area that generates the data and therefore that area owns the data. So for example, data that is generated within a contact center is owned by the management team within the contact center. Data that is generated by a finance department is owned by the finance department. Similarly, data that is generated in the sales department is owned by the sales department. Therefore, the owners of the data are the ones that have the ultimate authority that can see what should be done with the data. Now, next we have the data standards group. This is made up of data stewards. Their role is to ensure data related work is performed according to operating procedures. They determine the usage permissions and policies, and they work with the business and technology around data issues and questions. And at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the delivery and execution group, which consists of data custodians or key subject matter experts. These persons are responsible for understanding data modeling, tracking usage, access and implementation, and ensuring data is available, accessible, well-performed, and recoverable. All these stakeholders highlighted within the pyramid are absolutely important in delivering data governance within an organization. Now the reality of data governance within a company is that the program takes a lot of time, money and effort to get going. Sometimes companies fail and keep going back to basics and then they have to start all over again. Of course, while this is happening, the rest of the company is very frustrated waiting on data governance to work. However, it is important to note that data governance is crucial and getting it right is important in delivering good quality analytic solutions that support business objectives. Governance may be difficult to achieve, but it is worth the effort. If companies do not govern data, it can be dangerous. According to Gartner's former vice president, there is not a company on the planet that does not have a data quality problem. Where a company does recognize they have a problem, they often underestimate the size of it. Dirty data is at the core of bad marketing and sales decisions. But I will endeavor to say dirty data is at the core of poor decisions right across the organization, not just limited to marketing and sales, but dealing with customer relationships 
and making strategic decisions on a long-term basis. Now let's take a look at this clip that shows a visual relationship between dirty data and the impact that governance has. Here's what the inside of your digital network looks like. What is the state of your data? Do you know who has access? Do you know who is accessing your data? Can anyone see anything they want? Do you want her looking at your confidential information? Of course not. Do you even know what's in there? What is she storing on your servers? Wait, was that a bunch of music files? Unless you know who has access, who is utilizing that access, and what they are doing with data, you are open to anyone looking at anything. What are you going to do to prevent this from happening to your data? Sphere can help you get organized. Not everyone who has access to your data is treating it properly. They may not be malicious, but they are still going to cause you issues. Do you have a policy that can identify issues promptly and handle any threats? Data loss from internal employees are more prevalent than hackers. They don't always have to be bad guys, but the damage can be just as bad. You are vulnerable. You may think you're safe, but there's always someone trying to get in. It can be hackers, competitors, or just about anybody these days. Your data is valuable. You don't want to be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal because you haven't kept it secure. Data loss is inevitable, but there are ways you can mitigate your loss. Having a strong data governance policy that is stressed from the top of the organization will create an environment of security and compliance that rings true throughout your organization. Sphere helps companies maintain compliance and security, whether you're a financial firm, a healthcare company, or anyone with data. Sphere can create a great data governance policy for you. Let us help make your office clean. Now, as we continue to look at the dangers of ungoverned data, according to the Data Warehousing Institute, data problems cost U.S. businesses more than $600 billion a year. Now, when we look at the industries that it impacts most, 80% of the companies in the lead generation industry are impacted the most by dirty data. Now, let's put this into perspective. The lead generation industry focuses on selling personal data of persons to marketing companies and other companies as prospects to sell them products. Now, companies are purchasing this data when majority of the data that these companies house are compromised. Following lead generation companies, 66% of marketing companies are working with data that is compromised that are inaccurate, followed by customer relationships and then by finance. Considering the impact of dirty data on the industries identified in the previous slide, it is important for us to note the dangers of ungoverned data. The first of which is lost in revenue. Creating projects such as marketing initiatives to identify prospects with data that is dirty or faulty could result in lost in revenues but not just lost in revenues. It also results in wasted resources, resources that were placed on the projects, human resources, technical resources, and otherwise. Working with dirty data that is also ungoverned means that there will be a decrease in productivity. 
persons will have to spend a lot of time trying to fix issues and data instead of working on different aspects of a project to deliver an outcome. Using bad data to make decisions that ultimately go to market could result in a damage to credibility. In addition to that, there's a risk of failure for marketing initiatives and fines due to compliance issues. Most recently, we have seen Google and other tech companies that have received significant fines based on breach of the GDPR Act that has been created by the European Union. Of course, having poor data quality fundamentally will impact your ability to reach a prospect by email, phone, or mail. If you think of your organization data, I am sure that you can think back to a time, whether present or in the past, where your data for your clients is riddled with a lot of errors. Errors related to the format of the email address, the format of the phone number, or just having these data elements missing completely. So you may have the client's name, but you have no phone number to reach them. Or you have the client's name and the email address that you have for the client is not a valid one. And this, of course, impacts your ability to reach out to these clients for upselling and cross-selling purposes. Now with data quality, we use the principle garbage in, garbage out. Because it's in a computer doesn't mean it's right. It's not the things that you don't know that matter, it's the things that you don't know that aren't so. And so sometimes we're faced with data that we're using and we're not even fundamentally aware that data that we're using is riddled with errors or is dirty. But there are also the unknowns unknowns and these are the things that we don't even know we don't know. And what do we mean by that? Companies may be making decisions on data that they're not even aware of that is faulty and is not the true reflection of what is the state of the business operations. And so to address this, or even to start identifying these weakness in your data, governance is key to addressing data quality. Some important statistics to show to share data errors increase the business operation costs by five to ten percent organizations with high quality data they grow 35 percent faster than their competition and data driven companies consistently outperform their competitors by as much as six percent In managing data quality, the truth is data in the real world is dirty. It is incomplete. It lacks attributes and values. It lacks certain attributes of interest or contains only aggregated data. Data in the real world is noisy. It contains errors or outliers. It is inconsistent. It contains discrepancies in codes or names. Poor quality data means poor quality mining results. Quality decisions must be based on quality data, which is required for both OLAP and data mining. Now, OLAP and data mining are two key terms that we will discuss further and delve in to get a good grasp of the role that these two areas play in business analytics.
In managing data quality, generally, you have a problem if the data doesn't mean what you think it does or should. If the data is not up to specification, for example, if you're storing phone numbers and phone numbers should be 10 digits and the number that is being stored in a field for a client is six digits, then it's not up to specification. You have a problem if you don't understand the specification, the complexity of the data, or if you lack metadata. Now let's pause here and briefly discuss what is metadata. Metadata takes the form of a data di dictionary. It is data that provides you with information on what the data represents in your systems. So for example, if data is pulled from a system and is stored in rows and columns with different headings, a metadata or data dictionary, dictionary will help you to understand what each data stored in each row means. Now, in managing data quality as well, an issue that may affect data quality is the fact that you may have many sources and many manifestations of the same data. A popular example is having multiple systems that store your client data and having several records for the same client and slightly different variations in how the client record is stored. Now, data quality problems are expensive and they're pervasive. They cost a lot of money and it costs companies a lot of money per year. And resolving data quality problem is often the biggest efforts in performing a data mining exercise. Now let's take a look at this example. We have two records. Let's look at these two records. Can we interpret the data? What do you think the first field means? Is this first field a client name? Could it be a contract name? Could it be a product name? The second field, could it be a phone number? Could it be a contract number? Could it be a product code? What is the key? What allows us to uniquely identify each row of data? What is the unit of measurement, for example? In column three, is the unit of measurement dollars or is the unit of measurement euros? Are there data glitches? Are there typos? Do we have multiple formats? There's missing information. Field three, is it revenue? And is it in dollars or cents? As a business analytics practitioner, you will be faced with data that have varying formats and you are faced with the question of how to interpret the data. Metadata gives you that ability to interpret the data because it stores information on what each field of data means. Now, there are key elements of data quality that we need to be aware of. Data quality is a perception or an assessment of data's fitness to serve its purpose in a given context. The elements of data quality include the following. Accuracy, completeness, timeliness, consistency, integrity, and validity. 
we will discuss each of these in the upcoming slides. Accuracy. This determines if data was correctly recorded. It refers to whether the data values stored for an object are the correct values. Now, an example of accuracy is if the price of an item is $1,000, but on the system it is reflected as $900, then we would say that the data is inaccurate. Accuracy therefore means that whatever is reflected on a system as it relates to data must be representative of reality. Completeness. Completeness implies having all the necessary or appropriate parts being entire, finished, and total. For example, if you're onboarding a client, we require first name, last name, TRN, and date of birth to offer a client a product. If any one of those four fields are missing, then we would classify that record as incomplete. Completeness, of course, is based on context. Context will determine all the necessary pieces of data that are important for a particular situation. Once the record is missing one or more pieces of information, then we refer to this record as incomplete. Timeliness. Timeliness is the degree to which data conforms to a schedule for being updated and made available. For data to be timely, it must be delivered according to schedule. An example of timeliness would be, if a client comes into an office and submit a new proof of address, then it is expected that within a particular time frame, the business will update the existing residential address so that when communication goes out to the client via traditional mail, the communication will end up at the correct address. If the company does not act within a timely manner to update the record of the client, then we would consider that this data is of poor quality because of the missing element of adhering to the particular timeline. Validity. Validity is different from accuracy. It is the degree to which data conforms to a set of business rules, sometimes expressed as a standard within a defined data domain. An example of validity is that all tax registration numbers must be a length of nine digits. For a TRN to be considered valid, it must be nine digits. It means therefore a TRN with 12 digits or seven digits would be considered invalid. It is important to note that a value can be valid but inaccurate. So you can have a TRN number that indeed has nine digits and is considered valid. However, it does not accurately represent the person's TRN and therefore is inaccurate. Consistency. Consistency can be thought of as the absence of variety or change. It is the degree to which data conform to an equivalent set of data produced under similar conditions or a set produced by the same process over time. For example, if two individuals are generating sales report for a particular period, if the data is considered consistent, then it means that their report should be reflective of the same figures, as well as if a client record is consistent, then you should see in your systems the same name, 
same email address and the same TRN numbers for clients, despite which system house this information, and therefore information would be considered consistent. Integrity. Integrity is the degree to which data conform to data relationship rules that are intended to ensure the complete, consistent, and valid presentation of data. Now, these relationship rules represent the rules that govern how a business will operate. For example, in the insurance industry, a beneficiary cannot exist unless there is a primary insured for a policy. So someone must own a policy where they're covered for insurance before a beneficiary can be created within a system. In banking, integrity is enforced when we create primary owners and joint owners for bank accounts. For a joint owner to be created, a primary owner must exist first. Now, let's discuss some key data cleaning principles for ensuring that we have good data quality. Our first principle is that planning is essential. In cleaning data, you must develop a vision as to what it is that you expect. You also have to create policies surrounding how data should be handled within your organization and as well as a strategy for the actual cleaning of the data. Now, one strategy in data cleaning is to use what we call total data quality management cycle. In this process, we define what it is that we're trying to achieve for example, we would like to improve the data quality for TRNs to move from just 60% of our clients having TRN to 80% of our clients having TRN. So that's the first thing. We would define the expectation. And then we have to measure. We're measuring to see where we are, where we are in terms of the records that we want to clean. Once we have measured where we are, we now need to analyze how we will approach the cleaning of the data. This may include automated cleaning, or it may also include measures where we are physically or manually cleaning the data. Now, once we have identified those strategies, the next thing is to improve on the actual quality of the data that we are assessing. And so this is a cycle. We continue over time to define, measure, analyze, improve. And we repeat this cycle until we have established the data quality that we expect. The second principle is that organizing data improves efficiency. Now, the organization of data can improve efficiency considerably and reduce time and the cost of data cleaning. For example, by sorting records in terms of date, it is possible to spot errors where a record may have been incorrectly recorded by date. If you are looking at data in a spreadsheet, and you sort data, for example, by figures. You may recognize what we call outliers, which are figures that are far greater than the expectation or far less than the expectation. And in addressing this, you're able to investigate what has caused either the ballooning of figures or a significantly smaller figure than you expected. And this will help you with cleaning your data. The third principle of data cleaning is that prevention is better than cure. It is far cheaper and more efficient to prevent an error from happening 
than to have it to detect and correct it later. It is also important then when errors are detected that a feedback mechanism ensure that the error doesn't occur again during data entry or that there is much lower likelihood of it recurring. For you to have prevention, it is important that for the frontline persons who are capturing data and entering data in the system, that they have due diligence and they pay very close attention to avoiding errors in terms of entry. Another way to prevent errors is to ensure that the systems that capture data, that there, there is enforcement for data entry. So for example, if a field can, should only accept numbers, then there are restrictions placed on that field so that words cannot be entered. If a field should accept a date, then the field should stipulate how the date should be formatted and reject data that is not in line with the format for the entry of the date into the system. Data cleaning principle number four. Responsibility belongs to everyone, the collector, the custodian, and the user. The data custodian has primary responsibility for data quality. The data custodian is the individual who is responsible for maintaining the systems that house the data. Their responsibility is to ensure that necessary technologies are in place to secure the data quality in terms of data being entered into the system and data being maintained in the back end. The collector has responsibility to respond to the custodian's questions when the custodian finds errors or ambiguities that may refer back to the original information supplied by the collector. Now, in the case of a bank, a collector would be the teller at the front end that is entering data into the system in terms of the amount of money that you have deposited or withdraw. In the case of a supermarket, the collector would be the cashier at the point of sale that is entering and scanning your items. In the case of a university or educational setting, the collector would be a teacher or a lecturer who enters your grades on the system. The user also has a key responsibility to feed back to custodians information on any errors or omissions that have, be, have come across, including errors in documentation associated with the data. A user is the person who is actually using the data that has been created in the system. So for example, somebody who is looking at a report on sales for a month to make a business decision would be considered a user. Data cleaning principle number five, partnerships improve data efficiency. By developing partnerships, data validation processes won't be duplicated and errors will be more likely to be documented and corrected. But who do we create partnerships with? We can create partnerships with other institutions that collect data. So for example, your institution use, utilizes TRN as a part of the onboarding process. A partnership can be created with eGov to validate TRNs to ensure that your TRN that is being entered into the system is a valid one. Partnerships can also be created with like-minded institutions that are developing tools, standards, and software. These institutions may have tools that can be used to clean your data. Partnership must also be developed internally with data users because they provide good feedback for improving data quality. These individuals identify where there are errors or issues related to the data that needs to be resolved. Partnership can also be created with statisticians and data auditors who can come in and assess your data, look at the quality, and give you a fitness report in terms of 
where you are with your data and potential recommendations on how issues can be addressed. A sixth principle for data cleaning is prioritization. Prioritization helps reduce costs and improve efficiency. It is important to concentrate on those records that offer the most value for data cleaning. Cleaning data can be very expensive, which means that not all data can be cleaned. However, when you concentrate on those data elements that add the greatest value to your organization, it helps to reduce costs. Therefore, you should ignore data that are not used for which data quality cannot be guaranteed. Focus on cleaning lots of data at the lowest cost, which means that you, as much as possible, need to, need to engage in automated cleaning. For example, those that can be examined using batch processing or automated, automated methods before working on the most difficult records, which may need manual cleaning. A seventh data cleaning principle is to set targets and performance measures. Performance measures are a valuable addition to, qual to quality control procedures. It helps an organization manage their data cleaning processes. Now, measurements are a good way for you to track the performance of your data quality initiatives. For example, if you have a target that says 65% of all records have been checked by a qualified taxonomist within the past five years, then you know that this is the goal that you should be achieving over the period of time. This means that you have a goal stick to measure your initiatives against, and so you can report on your prog progress to the necessary stakeholders so that they understand how well the initiatives are working or you can go back to the drawing board to change the initiatives that you are pursuing to ensure that you meet your target. The eighth data cleaning principle is that education and training improves techniques. Poor training, especially at the data collection and data entry stages of the information quality chain is the cause of a large portion of errors. Good training of data entry operators can reduce the error associated with data entry considerably, reduce data entry costs, and improve overall data quality. This means that within an organization, if persons do not adequately know how to interact with the system or have been trained poor poorly on how to interact with the system, then it is possible that we will end up with poor data quality. The remedy, therefore, is to ensure that we educate the data entry personnel to utilize the system in an effective way so that we have good data quality. The ninth data cleaning principle is that accountability, transparency, and auditability are important. It is important that we plan data cleaning exercises in advance. Ex data cleaning exercises are inefficient when they are haphazard and unplanned and generally are unproductive. Data cleaning processes need to be transparent and well-documented with a good audit trail to reduce duplication and to ensure that once corrected, errors never reoccur. Within data quality policies and strategies, clear lines of accountability for data cleaning needs to be established. The 10th data cleaning principle is that documentation is the key to good data quality. Without good documentation, it is difficult for users to determine the fitness for use of the data and difficult for custodians to know what and by whom data quality checks have been carried out. Documentation will include the processes that should be adhered to when entering data. Documentation will also cover the principles and guidelines for treating data, how data should be shared within the organization, and who has what, what rights to work with the data that is created. Documentation 
provides an excellent audit trail and guidance on previous work done and work that is to come in the future. And now an important part of data governance is data security. Data security refers to protective digital privacy measures that are applied to prevent unauthorized access to computers, databases, and websites. Data security also protects data from corruption. Why is data vulnerable? Data is vulnerable due to hardware problems. Let's face it, computers will break down. You may end up with configuration errors, as well as you may have damage from improper use of the hardware, as well as crimes that are committed. Data is also vulnerable because of software problems. This may result from programming errors, installation errors, or unauthorized, unauthorized changes in the software. Disasters as well will impact the vulnerability of data. You may have power failures, and if power failures happen while systems are online, data may become corrupted. Floods and fires and other forms of disasters can also impact your data quality. The use of networks and computers outside of the firm's control also impacts your data and the vulnerability of the data. Data that is housed by vendors, data that is stored offshore and in the cloud are outside the control of the company and therefore they are liable, liable to attacks that you have absolutely no control over. Data is also at risk because of hackers. Now, it's important to note that hackers are different from crackers, and there is an ethical difference between the two. A hacker is someone who wishes to enter your systems without authorization for the purpose of harassment, showing off, or gaining access to computer services without paying, and the intent is to obtain information to sell. A cracker, however, is someone who has been paid by your company to penetrate your system in testing the resilience against hacks. To further cement the difference between a hacker and a cracker, Let's look at a clip of Sunny being hacked. Now it's the case of one hacker versus Sony. George Hotz, aka Geo Hot, is a 21 year old hacker from New Jersey. And he was the first person to jailbreak an iPhone. And last month, he was the first one to fully hack the PS3 console. He released this code online along with a how to video and now finds himself embroiled in a legal battle with the mega corporation. And it seems like he's got them pretty ticked off. This week, George released a blog entry asking the media, supporters, anybody for financial help. But what exactly is his cause? And does he think that he can win? Well, joining me from our studio in New York is electronics hacker George Hotz. George, thanks so much for joining us. Now, I just mentioned that you were the first person to jailbreak the iPhone. You did it with the iPad, too. Now you have PS3. Are you trying to get famous here? I mean, I, I have to say that it isn't totally selfless, but what's more important than me is, you know, the freedom to use the devices that you paid for in any way you see fit. So is that what you say uh, your cause is? Yeah, I, I'd say my cause is to, you know, if companies want to put these security measures on these devices, great, good for them. But if we want to come in and we want to remove these security measures so we can do legal things with our devices, then I think we have every right to. And I guess that's my cause. But, you know, I think the, uh, one of the problems that Sony has is that people could start using uh, this with pirated video games if they are uh, opened up, right? Well, they can't use my stuff with pirated video games. I made, a, I made a special effort when I released my stuff to not support pirated video games. But more pressing than that is just the immensity of the press and, you know, attention Sony has brought to this issue that has never affected more than a very small segment of their customers. Well, I got to say, Sony really is, seems to be taking this uh, 
you know, in a very difficult way. Like, this seems very harsh on them because they're going after it. They basically just want to control the entire Internet. I know that they asked the judge if they could erase this code from the Internet that you put out there, but I mean, do they not get that once that information's out there, it's out there? You can't just wipe it clean? I mean, they're using, they're using fear-mongering tactics. They clearly say on their blog, you know, oh, we're banning everybody who uses uh, any hacks, but everyone else, you can continue playing without fear. And the fact that they use the word fear, like, they're just, you can't suppress information. Once it's out there, it's out there. But I'm wondering, is some of that fear working? I mean, you are one individual hacker going against Sony. This is a mega corporation. I mean... You know, every day I wake up and I do think about the lawsuit. And you know, there's there's a small element of fear, but on the whole, fear doesn't win. And that's been proven time and time again. And it's a lesson they don't learn. Well, I think it seems to me like you're having a little bit of fun with this also because you did release a rap video, which I find very amusing. And we have a little clip of it that we're gonna play for our audience. I shed a tear every time I think a lick sang. Man, they're a corporation and I'm a personification of freedom for all You fill dockets like that's a constant farm to y'all The lawyers muddy water and TRO stall Out of business is jail for me and you're suing me civilly uh, Now George, I would say you should keep your day job But it doesn't seem like that one's going so well for you either Considering that you're getting sued uh, What's the deal with the rap song? Was that just for fun? Or are you really trying to uh, send Sony a message there? I mean, you know uh, I think about the lawsuit a lot, and I, I wanted a creative outlet for my, for my energies that wouldn't harm anyone, just in good humor, and I, I think it was pretty well received. Well, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, what's the maximum fine? Uh, is there a prison sentence? What are you really up against? No, it's, it's a civil lawsuit. I mean, look, I'm right here. Do you really, if Sony really wants something from me, come and ask me for it. I really don't think they want, you know, my car, which doesn't work, and the... You know, the money I've accumulated in the last few years, what they want is to send a message. And it's ridiculous. I mean, I think we should send the, the opposite message back. You know, I bought a uh, Sony Xperia X10 a couple days ago, and I'm looking into the security on that. I'm going to look into the security on the Xperia Play because, you know, in the end, freedom prevails. I can't believe that you're being sued by Sony, and yet you're going out there spending your money buying more Sony products right now. That seems preposterous to me. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I bought it used. I didn't support Sony directly. You know, but on the whole, I like Sony. I think their products are pretty good. I think they have some issues that they need to work through in management. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully after this blows over, they'll... Uh, you know, take a look at what they did and how they can do it better next time. So you really think this is going to blow over? You think that you have a chance of beating them? Oh, without a doubt. I, I think I, I, not only, I think I will beat them. Um, I mean, I think the reason they brought the suit is just to harass me and just to, you know, this is what happens to you if you hack Sony products. And I think, you know, beating them in court is just a start. Okay, so I'm curious. You did the iPhone, the iPad, now you have the PS3 under your belt. What's your next project? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't like to talk too much about my later products. Uh, a lot of my ener a lot of my later projects, a lot of my energy now is being focused on Sony. Um, you know, both in the courtroom and out of the courtroom. But you know, I'm excited for the iPhone 5. All right, so you're not really even going to tell us. Um, now, lastly, I just want to ask you, you put a video out there asking the media, asking people for funds. I mean, clearly it's not cheap to fight a corporation like Sony. And uh, are you getting a lot of good responses? According to Ars Technica, you have friends with very deep pockets. Um, as I read in the comments somewhere, I have a lot of friends with shallow pockets. And... I was amazed. I put that up, and in two days, I covered my legal costs and more. I'm not going to go into exact details on the numbers, but I, I feel very confident monetarily. That well, so they're not going to beat me by, you know. So they're not going to rob you blind, is what you're saying. Well, it seems like there are a lot of people out there uh, supporting your cause, and apparently the code is out there. Sony can't do anything about it, but they are putting out threats that anybody who uses a PS3 console that has been hacked uh, will now be kicked off the network. Not really sure how they're going to do that, but um, George, thanks so much for joining us, and we will continue watching your lawsuit as it unfolds. Thanks a lot for having me.
Now let's take a look at ethical hacking, otherwise referred to as cracking. Yeah, I just flipped the lights on. The door was just open. Basically anything that could ruin a company, we try to access. So we're about to hit up a power substation. It's surrounded by a barbed wire fence. We will get in, there's no doubt about it. I'm in the building. Server room. We're not seeing cameras. I think the surveillance sign is a lie. It's kind of creepy, yeah. We are the attacker team. We are offensive security. Our, our goal is to achieve full access. I'm extremely optimistic. This guy, holy buckets. The wonderful thing about all of this is it's perfectly legal. <laughs> we like to bring in a mix of people with different technical skills. I'm going to pretend like we work here. My specialties, if you will, really involves social engineering. Now what I'm doing is I'm going to download some malicious scripts. Uh, background mainly in application pen testing. Given a determined enough attacker, it doesn't stand a chance. I come from the, the military, specifically the Army, as a paratrooper and a medic. I originally practiced doing this stuff at home. Uh, penetration tester, uh, usually focus more on the network side of things. You need to have the ability to kind of think outside the box, then you can start to hack stuff. So we're currently on our way to the first office location where we'll be basically conducting reconnaissance just to see what the area looks like, where we're going to gain access, uh, what things we need to be aware of. We're sort of close. There's the offices. Anytime you're gonna break into a building, you have to be aware of people, you have to be aware of the security controls that they have in place. A reconnaissance is gonna help us figure some of that out. The target will be on the left. And this is the employee parking. Looks like there is not a fence along the wooded area. Drive casual. <laughs> the goal is going to be look at different approaches. Over here is all a neighborhood, and this, this is wooded. But there's no fence here. Look for cameras, try to get a sense of when people are going to be there. Office, office, uh, a bunch of cameras out on this side. What the surrounding area looks like. Are there neighbors who are going to see what we're doing who might call the authorities? We've got residents, so if anybody sees us, we got a problem. It looks fairly accessible. It'd be fairly simple to have somebody enter from the wooded area or simply just drive up into the employee parking lot like you belong and just walk up to the door. Uh, assuming there's not anybody inside, we should have free reign of the place. Social engineering is also referred to as people hacking. People are the number one weakness from a security perspective in any organization. Our costume is basically a technician. So you've got a polo, jeans, work boots. In order to capture some of this, we've also basically used a GoPro inside of a small satchel bag that's a, it's a bag camera. Right now, him and Paul are in the, in the lobby Talk, talking to the receptionist. They dropped two of our contact names. Contact over here to check on some speed issues and some uh, other stuff with the internet. Looks like they're getting visitor badges. It's not that unexpected that your internet service provider might show up to test if you're having speed issues with your network. doing a lot of sighing, which is typical of what we should be doing, kind of creating a sense of inconvenience, hoping to play on her, you know, 
willingness to want to help people. Confidence is extremely important and that will come naturally having done your homework in terms of uh, researching a company and, and solidifying a pretext. What if I just go with them? I mean, I call I don't know when you're doing that. Sounds like the receptionist is a little open, but this guy is very skeptical at this point. We look like we're about to go raid some shit. The thing about this, besides the fact that it is by far the most fun, is you got to think on your feet. We are going to try to get past physical security controls. Of course, we're an ethical hacking company, so what that means is we're not going to break stuff. Okay, so you guys are going to go in first. I think we should wait for you in the garage mm -hmm. so that when you get to that back door, we can just let you in. We went in in two teams. One team went in uh, through a wooded area where it wasn't fenced in, approached the back door. The other team simply parked in the employee lot and walked to the employee entrance as though that's where we're employees, we're supposed to be there. Some doors, you can use what's called a shove it tool. It's basically a way just to get in there and get the door to open. Make a dash for that dumpster. Ready? We have a tool that we can use to go underneath the door to snake up to grab a handle and simply pull down on the handle from the inside and open the door. Sometimes the doors aren't locked. I mean, first thing is just check if it's open. Okay. Okay. Doors open. <laughs> We've already found three iPads and a uh, laptop. So we're, we're doing pretty good so far. Credit cards be mine, including pin numbers. <laughs> It's designed to be physically deployed at our target location, that we want to maintain a, you know ongoing or rather persistent connection. It's a small computer that's just a hardware botnet computer. So what we can do is plug that into an outlet and then into the network as well. Remotely we can control that, uh, install software like malware scripts, uh, penetration testing scripts, things like that. We had free reign of the office space for as long as we wanted, hacked a few computers, had some pretty good success there. In fact, since achieved domain admin credentials in their network just from that visit alone. We got everybody. Everybody has their equipment. Yeah, our cell phones in the truck. Coast is clear still. Walk, don't run. Just walk normal. Walk Calm down, down dude.
there's microwaves that go out from a sensor. Anything that's in front of it, it's going to bounce off. That sensor is going to have a resistance and read it back saying, okay, I know something's here. A1 flight right there. Looks like they're on their way back. This was way better than a long ass walk through the cold woods. Given the sensor is so close to the ground, we could just toss Steve over the fence and then block the sensor. Once the sensor's blocked, we wait a minute to make sure that the, the camera hasn't gone off. Now we're in. We actually don't know about the sensor itself, but the camera has 280 degree view, which basically means that it can't see behind the pole that it's mounted on. Okay, we need to get the, the shield out. Thank you. You look cold, buddy. It sucks out here. All right. What this is gonna do is this is going to block the infrared component of the sensor. You should effectively see my body heat disappear. And we're going to send Steve over the fence again. So we're gonna stay as far out as possible that we feel safe and just arc around it. So pretty much looking at a straight on shot to the corner. It's either gonna work and we're gonna be brilliant for it or it's gonna fail miserably. So we're wearing uh, the smog type thing to protect from any arcs that would happen. You wear cotton clothing so that in the event that you get hit with an arc, your clothing burns instead of melting to your skin. Everything is completely self-sufficient in here so long as it stays plugged in. The next thing we're going to do is make sure that we can hit the internal network. We're not gonna cut a lock. We might try to pick a lock, but you know, I'm not gonna just smash the thing with a hammer. It's an art. When you can't break it, just dismantle it. We're in. It's effectively a, a cloner. We'll be able to capture employees' cards and write them to our own cards to get unfettered access into the building, usually at night. What are you doing? It's the fake badges that we created. Work great. Yeah, actually, I'm just looking for the bathroom. Uh, just through the front right here. Do you have a pass? Uh, no, I don't. This isn't a normal USB drive. We've just written some basic code. When we plug it into somebody's system, it's going to automatically work. I can basically do anything that he can do on his machine just remotely. We found some unlocked systems, uh, actually dropped some malicious files on them. I can start the microphone on the computer. So I can now start listening to you physically talking. I can take a screen capture of what's on your desktop and take pictures with your webcam to see if you're sitting at your computer or not. No, he, he pretty much got in his truck, showed up and cornered us. Completely honest, my nerves are a little bit shot with this guy. These companies understand that they need to have a stronger security posture. It's increasing awareness and companies are starting to do much better. We still have a long ways to go, but we, we're, I think we're seeing improvements out there. Yeah. You think you have all those little holes patched and, and then you find out that, you know, they found another way to get in. Where was it? Open. 
It is a good experience and it is a learning experience. It feels like sometimes you take two steps forward, but yet, you know, then you're taking two or three steps backwards. For buildings like this? Yeah. Really? Right now, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, the, the internet is kind of like the wild, wild west. Uh, maybe people aren't necessarily dying, but there's a lot of people hacking. And it doesn't take much to do so. Now that we understand the difference between hacking and cracking, let's look at some of the methods used by hackers to gain access to systems with our data. Hackers can use malware. For the first form of a malware are viruses. Viruses are rogue software programs that attaches itself to other software programs or data files in order to be executed. Hackers also use worms. Worms are independent computer programs that copy themselves from one computer to another over a network. A hacker may also use a Trojan horse. This is a software program that appears to be benign, but then does something other than expected. For example, you may download a software onto your phone or your computer for word processing or for listening to music, but in the back end, that software could be stealing data from your system. Hackers also use spyware. Spywares are small programs that install themselves on the computer to monitor user web surfing activity and serve up advertising. Spyware, in essence, tracks everything you do while you're on a web page, steals your information, and then uses that data to sell to other third parties for advertising purposes. Hackers also use keyloggers. Keyloggers record every stroke that is done on the computer to steal information such as serial numbers, serial numbers passwords, or even credit card data. A hacker may also use a sniffer. This is a eavesdropping program that monitors information that travels over a network. The sniffer enables the hacker to steal proprietary information, such as your email, company files, and so on, once the data has been transmitted over the network. A hacker may also use a denial of service attack. A denial of service attack floods a server with thousands of false requests to crash the network. The intent is that legitimate requests that actually want to access your network will be denied because of the thousands of requests that are keeping the server busy. The distributed denial of service attack simply means that there are numerous computers being used to launch a denial of service attack to your system to bring the network down much faster. Hackers will also try to steal your identity. Through identity theft, they will steal social security numbers, IDs, driver's license, or credit cards, and the intent is to impersonate someone else. Now, identity theft can be quite easy. Even for us locally in Jamaica, once you're able to gain access to somebody's birth certificate, which is public record, you will be able to create identity emerging from this piece of information. Hackers also use phishing. Phishing is the setting up of fake websites or sending email messages that look legitimate to a business to ask users for confidential personal data. Banks locally tend to be a target of phishing attacks quite often. 
Hackers may create email content that has the company's in Sigma and details that looks very legitimate as if it's coming from the actual organization. However, is it important to note that these communication normally request personal data which a financial institution would never do. Hackers also use evil twins. Evil twins are wireless networks that pretend to offer trustworthy Wi-Fi connection to the internet. An evil twin will give you open access to the internet so that the hacker can gain access to your device or to your, com to your laptops, phones, or desktop computers and steal the data from these devices. Now, outside of hackers, companies also face internal threats from employees. Internal threats may originate within the organization due to inside knowledge, sometimes sloppy security procedures, as users of computers leave their desk without locking their screens. Sometimes these threats can result as a, from a lack of knowledge. Employees may not be aware of what are the expectations as it relates to dealing with security threats and therefore do not practice due diligence. An important method that is also used by external persons to gain access to company data through employees is social engineering. Social engineering is tricking employees into revealing their passwords by pretending to be legitimate members of the company in need of information. Social engineering will result in having persons divulging data that under regular circumstances they wouldn't have simply because they have been manipulated into doing so. Now with the different threats that have been identified, the, the logical question is how do we mitigate against these security risks? One mitigating strategy is to have intrusion detection systems. This is used to monitor hotspots on corporate networks to detect and deter intruders. You can examine events as they're happening to discover attacks in progress. Companies may also use antivirus and anti-spyware software. This is used to check computers for the presence of malware and can often eliminate it as well. However, this requires continual updating to ensure that the antivirus is up to date in responding to new attacks. A company may also use a firewall and firewall can also be used on personal computers. A firewall is a combination of hardware and software that prevents unauthorized access to a network. In this diagram, the setup of the firewall is both internal and external to the company's web server. We have an outer firewall that stands between the internet and the company's web server and an inner firewall that stands between the company's web server and the corporate systems. Implemented on each firewall are policy and rules that guides the type of information that the company will allow to access or the type of authorization that the company will allow to access its web server and internal systems. Other mitigating strategies that a company may use to secure its systems and data is to lock servers physically. Companies can use removable hard drives that are locked when not in use, as well as hard drives that require special tools for detachment. Some companies utilize physical cages around computers that prohibit physical access from persons who should not be in the particular area that houses the servers. Additionally, companies may use authenticating procedures such as passwords and systems, which has become quite popular, smart cards that allow us to swipe to get entry within a building, 
as well as biometric authentication such as our fingerprints, our irises, and our voices. So in summary, we should remember that the aim of data governance is to establish consistent data quality, improve data integrity, control access, and address security and retention um, that we just discussed. Now, governance is about who also who owns data, how we give the right persons accessibility, how we control the security, how do we control quality, and how do we really gain knowledge um, from data. And at the end of the day, to make governance work, you need people, you need technology, and you need the processes in place that will ensure that you have good data quality and you have consistent processes that drive business outcomes. The benefits of implementing data governance is that people will understand their relationship to data and the impact that they have. People also understand the rules associated with definition, production, and the usage of data. And people will be held formally accountable for their actions with data. So if there are data breaches that are created as a result of negligence on the part of employees through data governance, they will be formally held accountable. People will also know when they need to be involved in data-related processes and persons will be communicated with depending on their relationship to data. Finally, in implementing a data governance program, there are some challenges that you will encounter that you must be aware of. First of which is cultural barriers. Organizations are set in their ways, especially if they have been ex in existence for a number of years and they're making profit and driving revenue. It will be a task to shift the culture within a company from doing things as they currently do to having a new normal. If there is no senior level sponsorship for your governance program, the governance program being successful will be impossible. Sometimes in implementing governance programs, persons underestimate the amount of work involved. And so one should be reasonable in what is expected and the length of time that it will take to make deliverables. Therefore, governance should be seen as a journey and not a one-off activity. Sometimes too much time is spent on structure and policies but not enough time on action. It is therefore very crucial that as we create policies, those policies are actually developed and brought to fruition. If there's a lack of business commitment, your governance program will not work as it is required that the business buys into the governance program and you have all hands on deck for success. Governance programs may also be challenged if the lack of understanding that business definitions vary. When the organization comes together to create policies, not everyone will agree on the business definitions for certain things. For example, the definition for who is a client. While a salesperson may regard a client as someone that they engage to sell a product, the accounting department may define a client as someone who has business on the books and are actively paying or actively purchasing. Marketing, however, may view a client as any individual, whether currently having business or not, that we are pushing and promoting sales to. These type of challenges will create some amount of misalignment between the different departments within the business, but it's important that everyone understands that their definition based on context is correct and it should be used as the need arises. Finally, trying to move very fast from no governance to enterprise-wide governance may result in failure. Again, think big, and implement small and eventually in bite-sized pieces your governance policy and program will ultimately be rolled out.
Now let's do an exercise on the general data protection regulation. On this slide, we have eight principles listed as a part of the GDPR. And I want you to examine these eight principles and select one of the principles highlighted on the slide and provide a solution on how an organization could implement measures to ensure the principle is addressed in their daily operations. Now go to ELS and post your response in addressing these issues as a part of an approach to governing data. This marks the end of lecture two.